in the past hundred years, we managed to double our lifespan. This massive achievement required a number of ingenious solutions to many difficult problems. But we solved them all, and we continue to learn, so we should expect to solve many more. Thinking of aging and dying, could we perhaps simply consider them as two further problems which just need solving? An increasing number of scientists are beginning to think that we probably can. Firstly, there are life forms in nature that live far longer than humans, that don't seem to age at all, that can survive the most extreme conditions, and even those that temporarily choose to die and disassemble their genetic material only to reassemble it again much later when the environmental conditions improve. Some even seem to be able to survive in space for a very long time. Clearly, nature has already provided us with examples of life forms that seem to defy aging, play with its own death to its advantage, and aren't even limited to Earth as their habitat. But the vast majority of life forms that we know on Earth will age and eventually die. Because of this, some think that aging is simply programmed with death as its inevitable consequence so that we could make room for new generations. In this way, our species is able to adapt to a constantly changing environment because the fittest among us will survive each environmental change and give rise to new generations that are better adapted. Perhaps this is precisely what kept us alive as a species to this day. Aging and dying may not be inevitable processes, but rather desirable ones from the perspective of the entire species. But something very unusual has been happening in the past few decades to the environment in which humans live. With improved housing and sanitation, food and safe drinks broadly available, and protection from infectious diseases, many people became optimally nourished, live in safe and clean environments, feel protected against any threats from the nature, and even keep themselves entertained most of the time. Little by little, people optimized their environment. This led to several unexpected observations. In nearly all countries, new generations grew taller than the previous ones, have higher IQ on average, and the age at menarche is decreasing. These so-called secular trends imply an accelerated growth and development. They have been consistent for several decades and they signify that an optimized environment allows modern humans to get the most out of their inherent biological potential. Now that our energy is no longer wasted on fighting life-threatening infections through our childhood and adolescence, we begin to reach our maximum potential in the wealthiest countries. Longer and safer lives lead people to choose to have fewer children. As a result, populations of the wealthy countries stabilized at the levels reached at the end of the 20th century, and some are now in slow decline. Also, in those countries, we increasingly see that 110 to 120 years may well be our biological limit in terms of how we were initially designed. To go beyond that, we'll need to redesign ourselves. There are only a few obvious biological constraints placed on us as a species, and all of them could potentially be overcome in time. Firstly, trillions of our cells continuously divide, but they can't divide forever. With each division, small structures at the end of our chromosomes, called telomeres, seem to shorten. Once they become too short, our cells can no longer divide, placing a definite limit to our lifespan. If that process could be better understood, and then controlled artificially, then our cells could be allowed to divide forever. We know that some cancer cells do, because they lost that constraining mechanism. So, it is possible to overcome it, but we need to learn how to do it without turning ourselves into one large cancer tissue. 
For their understanding of the role of telomeres, American scientists Elizabeth Blackburn, Carol Greider and Jack Shostak received Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2009. Another constraint arises from accumulating errors in our genetic information over time, which makes us look like increasingly pale copies of ourselves. Just like recopying a page of printed text dozens of times on a photocopy machines, the same is happening to us. Through cell divisions, billions of letters in the genome are being copied within trillions of cells. Tiny mistakes will inevitably arise simply through chaotic processes making us increasingly dysfunctional. But mutations can also accumulate because of another, very interesting mechanism called oxidative stress. As life firstly developed in the oceans, early life forms relied on so-called anaerobic metabolism and didn't require oxygen as a source of their energy. But some of the bacteria that made it out of the water and inhabited the land eventually realized that basing a metabolism on oxygen is far more energy efficient. At some point, a tiny anaerobic amoeba that crawled out of the water swallowed a microbe that could process oxygen, and the first mitochondrion was born. We all transport oxygen to our mitochondria, where energy for each cell is produced. We think of oxygen as something very positive, but oxygen is actually a very dangerous explosive gas which needs to be handled carefully. It will ruin any banana that you forget on your kitchen counter and also oxidate any monument. Oxygen is good for getting energy efficiently, but its aggressive properties will eventually ruin a mitochondrion from within. Once it falls apart, Free oxygen radicals will bombard the nucleus of the cell, causing chemical reactions with genetic information and leading to new mutations. What could we do to prevent accumulation of mutations and retain ourselves in a state where we always look like we're young? If we could somehow stabilize the membrane of the mitochondrion so that it doesn't break up once destroyed from within, and therefore retains all oxygen radicals, that would be an excellent progress. We could perhaps invent a way to repair DNA and restore its original information. The mechanisms of DNA repair already exist, and they are very active. In 2015, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded to Thomas Lindahl, Paul Modrich and Aziz Sankar for understanding how cells repair damaged DNA and safeguard the genetic information. However, repairing mistakes and restoring the initial code is one thing, but what if we were able to completely rewrite the genetic information contained in any living cell and doing it as we please? This is exactly the result of a major progress achieved in the past decades, which arose from understanding of how bacterial genomes protect themselves from viruses. It's called CRISPR-Cas system and it is essentially an immune system of single-cell bacteria which helps them to resist genetic elements inserted by viruses that attacked those bacteria. When the Human Genome Project was completed, we were able to see our own code for the very first time. We resembled a colony of robots forgotten on this planet which somehow realized how to print out their own computer program. We don't understand our own code yet. We are only beginning to suspect what some of its sections may mean. But only years after we managed to firstly print it out, we already possess a tool to completely rewrite it. The key question is, who in the sane mind would want to rewrite their own program which already enabled their entire growth and development in such an incredibly precise way without firstly understanding what the code actually means. But once we understand it, the opportunities will truly be endless. In science, the key progress is made when there is demonstration that something that no one thought was possible is in fact possible. As an example, 
it was well known that our cells differentiate and eventually become a liver cell, a neuron, a nail, an eye cell or a bowel cell. But few would suspect that once a cell is differentiated, that it could again de-differentiate and become so-called pluripotent stem cell, which could then be reprogrammed to develop into any other cell in the body. But this is exactly what brought Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2012 to John Gurdon and Shinya Yamanaka, for the discovery that mature cells can be reprogrammed to become pluripotent again. Now that we know it's possible, this amazing breakthrough actually makes sense. All our cells developed from the copies of our very first cell. So they all must carry all the information required to become any cell, even if all that information isn't used. This progress should allow us to develop reserved organs, clone them for our own cells, or even, quite remarkably, clone ourselves all over again from any of our reprogrammed cells. This was already done for a mammal, Dolly the sheep, was cloned from an adult cell here in Edinburgh in 1996 using the process of nuclear transfer and causing quite a shock over this prospect becoming a reality. Finally, if we could allow our cells to divide forever and also keep the information in our genome unchanged, would this mean that we would then live forever? Well, it seems that there would still be another problem. It's related to our memory. Early life forms only had short-term memory. The fish Dory from Finding Nemo is a prime example in popular culture. Neural cells would divide, just like all other cells, and any memories that were formed would be erased. But at some point, evolution started to prefer neurons that don't divide. Such neurons could store long-term memories. The process of evolution realized that it's better to remember everything and avoid repeating dangerous mistakes. Those who could do this were more likely to survive. Permanent neurons never turn into cancer because they do not divide. But if a spine is broken, then a gap between permanent neurons, which would easily be repaired by the cells that can divide, simply can't be bridged. That's a downside of being able to store permanent memories. But the problem is that these permanent neurons seem to be prone to dysfunction over a longer period of time as their material becomes exhausted in absence of cellular division. After about 100 years, the prevalence of memory loss, called dementia, starts growing so markedly that we may all eventually become demented we will need to find a way to keep those memory cells alive and well forever. Perhaps even better, we could download all the information that they store to some electronic device and keep it there as a backup. It's still a science fiction today, but in the future, who knows? In recent years, people are considering cryogenics as a possible solution to this time gap which still lays ahead until those big new discoveries allow us to live far longer than we do today. It would be good if we could preserve our functional state and wait for science to progress so that it could save us at some future point. But it is increasingly apparent that having exhausted our biological potential and starting to consider new solutions, the questions of ethics will become just as prominent as the research itself. Are we allowed to change our original design in order to live much longer? And when it comes to something so important to us all, who decides what is right and what isn't?